All right, thanks everybody for coming. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Jennifer, this is my shop. I opened at the beginning of uh, 2021, almost a year ago. And um, it's designed as a place of welcome and comfort and inspiration. And I'm so excited to have tonight um, Paul Haddad, whose work I knew from his um, 10,000 Steps in LA book. Is that the name of it? Yeah. Did I get it right? I think it's a couple the of steps books. Of, the step, 10, steps a day in LA. Yeah. And 10,000 Steps a Day in LA, which yeah. I purchased at Costco several years ago and went through many of the walks. And then I love books like that. Um, I love books that help you explore the city. And um, so that's why I'm excited about today's book. Um, Paul wrote a book about the history of the freeways in Los Angeles. And he's going to tell us about it with lots of photographs. And so we've got the screen set up and hopefully on the Facebook, everyone will be able to see all the pictures. Um, and here to interview him, I have Josh Stevens, who's an editor um, with the planning report. California Planning Development Report. Oh, California, California. Was it called the planning report at one point? No, a different publication. Sorry, sorry. I edited that a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul, uh, Josh is someone who, um, in his professional work, uh, covers a lot of the things that interest me as well. I have a degree in urban planning from back before my work in community development before I opened this shop. So um, I'm so excited to get deep on these issues um, of how Los Angeles was built and how these roads that dominate the way that our city was built and the way that we live, how they came about and, um, and to see it in photographs, I'm so excited. So thank you both for being here. Thank you all for joining us and everybody on Facebook and watching us future in the video world. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, thanks, y'all, for being here. Um, I'm really glad to be here because a lot of what I write about is not just the nuts and bolts of urban planning, which are regulations and very arcane stuff, but also about community and sense of place. And it's really nice to be here at a bookstore, which I think is a cornerstone institution, hopefully in every and any community. Um, it's nice to be here in person with everyone and, of course, to those of you streaming. Um, so I think it's special for us to be here. In a lot of ways, a place like this is a little bit antithetical to what a freeway is. Um, it's hard to read a book, have a beer, and have a conversation when you're at 70 miles an hour. Um, but I think we'll get into that. Um, I think I want to start this discussion. Um, I was just chatting with Paul, and Paul revealed that he, quite miraculously, I'm an author myself, I'm a journalist. Um, Paul miraculously wrote this book in roughly a year, um, which sounds like the most of the primary writing done in a span of a few months, which is very unusual and very impressive, um, especially for a book that relies on so much research as this one does. And it's really, you know, I, I'm not here to advertise, but I will advertise. It's a great book. It's a fun book. I think it's required reading for Angelinos. Um, but I think that you know, when we think about books, there's always an author, and we can often dig into the author's biography and the process and so forth, and we'll do that. But when we think about infrastructure, um, unless we were around when the infrastructure was built, whether it's a road or an airport or a canal or whatever, we sort of inherit those pieces of infrastructure almost as if they were already always there. You know, and I think those of us who drive in the freeways in LA, they're just part of our lives, and it's hard to know where they came from and why they came about. Um, I think this book, you know, is sort of taking us back in time and reminding us that infrastructure did not drop out of the sky, even though it now pollutes the sky. Um, so I think that that's my interpretation of the importance of this book. Um, and I think I want to start it by saying, um, or I guess the first question I'll ask for you, Paul, is obviously freeways are deeply intertwined in the life of LA. It's impossible to function in LA without them, indirectly or, or, or directly. And there's this notion that people in LA are in love with driving or in love with their cars. Is that a love affair or is it a codependent or toxic relationship? I think it's both. My love of freeways went back to when I was a kid growing up in Los Angeles. I like the speed and efficiency the fact that they look futuristic, the fact that you could get around quicker in the 70s and 80s. Um, but at this, by the same token, they are the roadways we love to hate. And we resent them because we are codependent on them. So I think, um, you know, we rely on them because sometimes we have to, and yet we resent the fact that we have to. That's how I kind of characterize it. You mentioned the futurism. Take us back to roughly the 1950s. Um, 
what was the vision for freeways generally? What was the vision for freeways in LA? How did the engineers, how did the public officials, how did the public feel about them as they were proposed? And then what happened? Yeah, and I can actually, that leads into some of my slides here. Um, the, the, this picture on the right that you see, um, oh, sure. Uh, so to share a screen, go back. Yeah. Zoom, share a screen. And share. Is it sharing? Looks like it's sharing to me. But all good. Okay. Uh, the so this graph, uh, this graphic on the right. These are the twelve primary freeways. The ones that are labeled. Uh, that are in my book because um, for really to break it down, there's about 24 freeways that go through Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County. These are the 12 primary ones that I focused on. Um, and what I, going back to the 50s, um, this, I'm just going to skip over this next, well, this next picture is just of me as a 16 year old driving the five freeway. It's proof that I was driving freeways in snowstorms through the grapevine. Um, that's my cousin Sandy, who is an urban planner now, by the way, with me. Um, and I took some pictures of some trucks and things that uh, there was a really there were some bad accidents. Um, but going to your your question about the 1950s, um, at that time there were, as you can see on the left there, many of our freeways that we know now. Like let's take for example the Five Freeway. It was known back then as the 101 or the 99. Um, the 110 was also the 66, the 11, they had numerous different numbers assigned to them. So when the freeways were built, they were assigned names because there were so many numbers that they adopted at the time that they were built. So that's when you came up with freeways like the Ventura Freeway, the San Diego Freeway. Um, it's the reason we still say the word the in front of route numbers because they were known as the Golden State Freeway. Um, the Hollywood Freeway. So now we just say the 101, the, the, the stuck around. Um, and this sign on the right is actually a sign that's in Burbank that precedes. This is a sign probably from the 70s, it, it maybe even the 60s, but probably the 70s when you wouldn't even necessarily put 134 next to the word Ventura. People just knew it when I was growing up as the Ventura Freeway. No reason to put a number next to it. But I see some younger people here, many uh, younger generations and people even of my generation just refer to freeways by their numbers now, the blank. Um, going, I don't know if I still answer your question, but this takes us to the 50s right here. Um, the feeling back in the 50s was so different than it is now because it's all about progress. It was about what will get people from point A to point B in the quickest amount of time. Neighborhoods be damned. Freeways became this iconic feature of Los Angeles that graced postcards. We, we were even bragging about how confusing the roadways were on postcards. Man, take those crazy freeways. Um, and even it was so pervasive, the uh, the stereotype of L.A. as a place with freeways that you would even see it in Looney Tunes cartoons, um, like this one called Their Auto Be a Law from 1953. And this poor gentleman who's going through the clover leaves, if you watch the cartoon, he can't get off the freeway. He's just stuck on it for hours. And... He's on it so long, he's on it for over a year that he opened up a little hamburger stand uh, there because he can't leave the freeway. Which, by the way, there were two stories like this in the LA Times in the 50s that I came across during my research. That a guy got stranded on the Harbor Freeway. Uh, he somehow made it up on the middle median before there were walls and, and concrete barriers. There were just these mediums, which I'll get to later. It was just like a raised curve, basically. And he just accidentally got up there, then couldn't find his way off because of the streaming traffic. And he was up there for hours. And he got so frustrated, he took out a beach town and just started laying out on his hood. <laughs> and he said 18 cops went by and no one helped him. That one, one cop pulled over and said, well, you got yourself up there, get yourself off. And he finally got himself off. And uh, he, he said he wished there was a phone he could have called while he was up there. And then a few years later, call boxes showed up, um, introduced by Kenneth Hahn, former councilman and, and supervisor. So 
another reason there were so many freeways built here was this, keep in mind, um, the Collier Burns Act in 1947, named partly after Randolph Collier, who was in the state legislature. He helped kind of pave the way, so to speak, for freeways in the state. But then also uh, Dwight Eisenhower created, he passed the, uh, the Interstate and Defense Highways Act of 1956. And that created 45,000 miles of interstates. And many of our freeways are interstates, uh, the five, the 405. And you, you know, if you see the interstate insignia, then you know that the federal government sprung for 90% of that construction. And when you've got that incentive that the government will pay 90% of a freeway, of course you're going to build freeways like crazy. And that's what happened in the 50s and uh, from 1956 onward. And as we'll get to later, it wasn't until the mid to late 60s that public sentiment really started to change. And people, rather than idolizing freeways, started to really resent them. And because it went through their neighborhoods and quality of life suffered and, and those things that now are clearly front and center, especially with the infrastructure bill that's out in Washington now. Before we get into that, um, you mentioned sort of the, the techno optimism of freeways and of course all the money. Um, Remind us what preceded that. What was travel and transportation like within cities and particularly within LA before we invented these separated free traveling roadways, sort of before World War II? What were sure. we reacting against that might have made these freeways so appealing aside from the billions of dollars from the feds? Right. Well, Los Angeles is expanding. And if you looked at patterns of population and migration, people were moving into the valley. Uh, they were moving to the South Bay. Um, they had already moved there during World War II because of manufacturing jobs, shipbuilding. Um, they were moving west. You know, the, the 10 freeway was welcome with open arms when the Santa Monica freeway went through and opened up. But people were also getting killed on roads. And, and it sounds uh, almost counterintuitive, but freeways are safer than streets. You don't have cross traffic. Uh, everyone's going in one direction. They're very regulated. There's no stoplights. And uh, they also, the interesting thing I came across when I was writing this was many freeways, the origin stories of many of these freeways started at these really treacherous uh, areas, these passes that were dangerous where people died. More than once I came across the phrase blood alley. Like every, every section of LA in the outlying areas had a blood alley. Uh, Sepulveda Pass. And so they started the 405 in Sepulveda Pass to help mitigate traffic and to make, create a safer area because Sepulveda was a very windy road then. They reconfigured it with the 405. Much like Royal Canyon is still Yeah, there, right? exactly. And um, there was even a section near Newhall where the 14 and 5 meet. There were 47 people who died there in one year, 1968. And so that's where they did a lot of construction starting there. Um, and then Coenga Pass is where the 101 freeway started, the Hollywood freeway, because that was a dangerous spot. So you had these areas that um, they wanted to reinforce with safer roads. And that's often, that was a blessing at that time. So why don't you bring us to your slideshow? And I'll, sure. I'll interject. Well, when, when freeways opened, as you were pointing out, it was, um, it was a sign of progress. Los Angeles is open for business. And uh, this was our namesake was the LA freeways. They were world famous. Um, and of course, with that came a lot of pomp and circumstance. So uh, you had the opening, everyone knows the first freeway was the Arroyo Seco Parkway. And the, on the right there, the woman who is uh, standing in the middle is actually 17 years old. Her name was Sally Stanton, and she was the Tournament of Roses Parade Queen. And she, along with Governor Olson and a lot of politicos there and highway patrolmen, they, this kind of established the template of what freeway openings would look like. And early on, you also had, unfortunately, on the left there with the same freeway opening, um, you had uh, Indians, so Native Americans who were transferring over the land to the state with big smiles on their faces and peace pipes and, and peace drums, uh, drum circles. Uh, and these were photo ops. And this is a way to kind of maybe, you know, assuage white guilt and show everything's kumbaya. Um, but. It, it, Indians will make a reappearance here uh, as I'm going through the slides up until the last freeway that was ever built, the Century Freeway in L.A. You, you still have uh, uh, Native American um, rituals there in 1993. So um, you also had a lot of celebrities. So when the Hollywood Freeway opened, they trotted out Bob Hope, 
who was the master MC at the time, and he cracked a few jokes. It took a long time to open the freeway, so he he said he was uh, really sad that he's going to open because he missed his detour to Seattle because it's so nice this time of year. Um, and then uh, you had Gene Autry opening a, a freeway there on the left, another segment of the Hollywood freeway, and uh, he's the man in the middle with the white hat. Uh, the, the oversized scissors became another prop and um, another feature of, of freeway openings. This now you can see like is another <laughs> recurring feature is the use of beauty queens. Uh, the one in the middle and the lower left, that was the opening. Those are some opening segments of the Santa Monica freeway. You can see former or future mayor Tom Bradley peeking over the shoulder there of um, of Robert, uh, um, sorry, yeah, uh, McClure, Robert McClure on the left. The McClure Tunnel is named after him, where the Santa Monica Freeway ends. And um, the upper left is the opening, an opening segment of the Ventura Freeway. That's a high school marching band and cheerleaders. You also had um, Miss Simi Valley opening the Simi Valley in the lower right. So women were also part of the props that helped open freeways, and that was a sign of the times. But not so much part of the development of freeways. So. Not, nope, not until the early 60s, which we'll get to. But yeah, um, it was a good old boys club. You could definitely say that. And you see more women on the left here for the groundbreaking of the Simi Valley Freeway, which that was, that's the 118 freeway, also known as the Ronald. Well, I don't want to say too much here. So I get that later. Um, this is the uh, groundbreaking of the Simi Valley Freeway, and they're going to explode some rocks. Uh, that's literally dynamite that they blew up, and that's Miss Simi Valley in the middle. And then, um, you know, there were different creative ways of, of ribbon cuttings. The Hollywood Freeway pictures I showed you, that was actually a 35 millimeter ribbon. Uh, sometimes they would use, um, in the case of the, the, that goat there in the middle, instead of a, a ribbon cutting, it was a ribbon chewing. When they opened up the, the Golden State Freeway next to the LA Zoo, uh, so a, a goat from the zoo chewed through the ribbon. And then on the right, uh, there were missiles that were, quote unquote, launched, launching the freeway when the Ventura Freeway opened in 1962 near Laurel Canyon. So, like I said, women were part of the of of the opening of freeways um, up until the Century Freeway, you can see in the lower left there some USC cheerleaders. Uh, you had Shoshone Indians on the right. Um, I swear to God, the guy on the right looks like Nick Cage from Con Air. I, I guess he's someone who's really of the tribe. Uh, and then in the upper left, that's just another. Um, that's like a, a war dance. What that has to do with freeways, I don't know. But it was part of the ritual. Uh, that was the Simi Valley Freeway opening. So, yeah, that was like uh, it kind of very cringeworthy coming across these for my book. But I did include some of them for context to show what went into the opening of freeways and um, it just the optics of them. It, it was it was a big deal. The, the governor, Governor Brown, especially Pat Brown, would fly down constantly just for opening this, the Las Cienegas segment of, of the Santa Monica Freeway with a blimp up in the air and a big tire hanging from the blimp that whooshed through the ribbon and everyone clapped and then he flew back up. So um, it was the go-go years, freeway building. Um, but in terms of uh, freeways going through Los Angeles, and, you know, everyone knows now, especially in the news, there has been, as we referred earlier, a lot of uh, talk about the infrastructure bill in Washington, which may involve decommissioning some freeways, maybe taking some freeways out of communities that were underserved, communities of color, uh, lower income, even Caltrans put out actually a statement. I was, I put it at the end of the book. It was something I stumbled on near the end. It didn't get a lot of play, but they put out a statement acknowledging that these communities were disproportionately burdened by freeways and that they hope to make reparations of some sort. And um, it was kind of an apology of sorts. And that is one of the questions I wanted to ask you. One of the big debates about freeways that have cropped up, it's always been around, but cropped up more recently. Are the racial and equity implications of freeways? And I see them both in terms of who they serve, about who can get from point A to point B, and who's who's point A and point B are they? But also, of course, the physical manifestations in communities. And there's the the claim 
that freeways are sort of inherently racist because many of them went through minority neighborhoods, taking homes and businesses by eminent domain. Do you see those freeway designers as deliberately racist or were they more oblivious or, or just blinded by their notion of progress, regardless of who or what might have been in their way? I think it was a systemic thing. You can't pin it just on the freeway builders because from Washington on down, it really was all about um, trying the interstate, for example, were created because it was the Cold War and we wanted easy access. Eisenhower had actually seen the Autobahn when he was a general in Europe fighting the Germans and he was very impressed by the Autobahn system, the you know, proto freeways in Germany at the time. Uh, and he always remembered that. And it's a way that they could have transported nuclear weapons across the country and through communities. So there was a sense of we're all in this together, you know, so there was that aspect about it. Shared sacrifice. Yeah, shared sacrifice. But uh, yeah, they, there, there also was a movement among urban planners and on a more local level to declare places like Bunker Hill or Boral Heights as blighted, as slum ridden. These are people of color who often live there. And so that gave um, permission to uh, take, put freeways through there and to also, if they wanted to acquire land as cheaply as possible. So by declaring these slums, it's a self-perpetuating uh, loop where the land is not worth much and thus the people who live there will have to be moved. And uh, you can run a freeway through there because, you know, certainly it's more expensive to put it in a place. The rights away would be more expensive in the more affluent neighborhoods. So it was a very convenient way of running freeways through those sections of LA, you know, that were not uh, in the suburbs. That were the, also, there was a movement away from inner cities in the 50s. And so many of these freeways, uh, a perfect example is the East Los Angeles interchange there on the left. Um, that's in Boyle Heights. You have six different freeways merging there. And um, th it was kind of like the idea of everything should spoke out of downtown. Let's just put freeways in downtown. The inner city's dying. Uh, it's all about the suburbs and spreading out. And so um, I think it's something like 18% of Boyle Heights or 15% is covered by freeways now. And the whole county of LA, it's like 1%. And certainly much, you know, like two, 3% on the west side. And on the right there is a picture of the right of way that Caltrans uh, wanted to do for the five freeway. And on the lower part, there's an orphanage in Boyle Heights. The it, freeway just went right through, that building was raised. And in the middle of the frame there, you could actually see a little lake. And that's Hollenbeck Lake, part of Hollenbeck Park. And so of course, rather than going around the lake, eh, we'll just put the freeway right over it. And that's what you see on the right. I took that photo of the five north just going over the southwestern portion of Hollenbeck Lake, which is in Boyle Heights. And it's it's really disturbing when you go there. It's like you hear this cacophony of trucks and uh, and it's it's always in shade and um, yet the right part of the lake, you see a little fountain there is always in sunshine. You can go fishing from the overpass. I mean, I guess there's that. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then there there were older people too. This woman I was really taken by. Um, I found her in the old Herald Examiner archives. Her name was Margaret Voss, 83 years old, lived on a street in Hollywood that's gone now because of the freeway. That's not her house being moved, but it was another elderly woman. And if you look really closely, you could see her standing in the portal there of her front porch, refusing to move. <laughs> She's like, I, I ain't going. So if you want to take this house, I'm going with it. Um, that was on Boylston Street. And then you did have the seeds of people protesting, and this is just kind of a montage of uh, some of the protesters. Um, that's Bacoima, when the 210 went through there, lower left. Uh, the upper left was people protesting in the 40s of the Harbor Freeway when that started to be built. That was like the third major freeway after the, the Royal Seiko in Hollywood. And that went through South Los Angeles, and that's a lot of South LA residents who are protesting. They never got their way. Back then, you know, they'd hear you and then they'd just still do whatever they wanted. Um, upper right is uh, when, you know, Caltrans would take over a lot of homes. Like everyone knows about the 710 freeway, the Long Beach freeway was supposed to go through South Pass. And Caltrans to this day still owns a lot of those homes. Um, but that, uh, what you see there is people protesting in Echo Park when they bought a home, of homes when they were going to extend the Glendale freeway, the two. And then the lower right is um, 
the 10 freeway through South LA. And um, the unfortunate thing with the black communities that had to leave as the freeways that were uprooted was they often had nowhere to go. And so they'd have to reach out to the Fair Housing Council to try to get housing because of redlining. And so it was- right. South LA was, red, was not redlined in the first place. So it was one of the few places where right, black people could live or economically in the first place. Right. And then they get kicked out of the one place where they can or one of the few places they can live. Correct. Yeah. And and then even when I think it was nineteen forty eight, the Supreme Court said that uh, racial covenants um, violated the fourteenth amendment, um, which was great, but then there are always workarounds. Like realtors would always find a way to work around that. And um I think in nineteen sixty three California passed the Rumford um uh, Fair Housing Act. But then the next year, realtors helped get Proposition 14 on the ballot, and then people voted for it, and that reinstated redlining essentially, like in so many ways. It, it was uh, it, it was all about freedom, you know, and and you could um, you could exclude certain people from living in a certain place in so many ways. They're very you know clever about the wording, and I think it was 1968 when the Supreme Court just said enough and passed the Fair Housing Act, and I mean, really, I mean, I was already born by then. It's just amazing how long that journey took. Um, so I was mentioning earlier how a freeway spoked out from downtown. Uh, you can see there, there the movements from 1945 to 1953. That's when this map is from. It was all about serving these pockets of suburbia. And that's what you see there is the people migrating to the valley, to the west side, and the south bay. This is what L.A. looked like then. This is where the movement uh, toward other sections of the city were happening. Um, and then this woman I just had to include because everyone loves this story. This is, woman wouldn't leave her porch. She was known as the Golden State Granny. Her name was Lami Puckett. And she looks like she stepped right out of a Norman Rockwell painting with a 30 gauge hot shotgun. Uh, <laughs> other than that, um, and she was a Texan, she was married, uh, she was a widow, had been married to a police officer and um, knew her way around a gun and, and it could, said she could shoot the head off a rattlesnake from 30 paces. Uh, she stayed on her front porch for two months and this is in Silver Lake. And her son, Ross, would then take over at night so she could sleep. Anyway, she became a very, um, she became this, this almost avatar for the anti-freeway movement and appeared on papers across the country. And there was a paper in Florida that said, is this the result? This, is this the end result of, uh, of freeway building? Is, you know, grandma's looking down the, uh, a, a, the scope of a surveyor, you know, of a transit scope or whatever. And, um, so she got a lot of sympathy and she was eventually tricked off her porch. On the right there, you can see a sheriff disguised as a media member, because by this point, there were a hundred people camped out on her in front of her front porch. And um, he acted like a media member when an interviewer, he gave her a writ that basically said that she had to leave. And there she is being taken away and not so happy about it on the left. Um, again, tons of newspapers covered this. Uh, she eventually, the, the twisty little coda to all of this is she was a wealthy uh, landlord. She owned 18 income units in the Silver Lake area. <laughs> so she wasn't as sympathetic as we thought. And she was trying to get a better deal for a house. They offered 8,000, she wanted 15. It was a duplex. And, uh, the, then the other funny thing was, um, she wasn't living there. She was just squatting there because she didn't want him to take it. She had another house up in the hills. And, um, her son, this is Ross. He ended up, he hated the highway barons also. You know, they were, um, both put up this fight for a couple months. He ended up working for the highway department in the right of way department, and he was the head of evictions. Wow. You can't write this. You can't make this you stuff up. Call this irony. <laughs> <laughs> Look up irony, and you see Ross Puckett right there. Um, but so here's the flip side to eminent domain and running freeways through poorer neighborhoods. Um, you guys, anyone recognize what freeway this is? Does it look familiar? The Hollywood Freeway, the 101 through Hollywood. And that's the Hollywood Tower building that eventually became uh, Guardians of the Galaxy ride, but used to be the Hollywood Tower building at California Adventure. Uh, the freeway just went around it because 
that was a very prestigious building, as well as that church you see back there. That's the first Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. It's been there since the 20s. They weren't going to tear that down. So the freeway, you notice it just threads the needle through the tower building and uh, the Hollywood Presbyterian building. These are two iconic buildings. They weren't going to raise them. Now, unfortunately, the people in Whitley Heights did not get to experience the same good fortune. Um, on the left was a proposed map to loop the Hollywood freeway around Whitley Heights. Whitley Heights is where, of course, uh, you had um, Rudolph Valentino, you had Charlie Chaplin living there. They lost their mansions. And even so, even celebrities were prey to the wrecking ball, their homes at times. But that freeway on the left there, engineering wise, would not have been feasible. That looks like something out of Bugs Bunny like that cartoon where the construction workers have to make a, a circle around his big giant hole that's like about 30 feet high. And what you see on the right is the actual path of the Hollywood Freeway now. And it just completely bisected with the heights. And, you know, to this day, it's it's a community that is just bifurcated by the 101. Uh, here's another example of um, a freeway going through the suburbs where people in Burbank, if you recognize, you can see that's the Hollywood Burbank Airport there on the left, and the um, the gray street that you can kind of see, I don't know if my eyes are picking up, probably not. Um, anyway, that gray street that kind of runs northeast of the airport is San Fernando Road, and people living on Glen Oaks, which is the blue line, upper part there is uh, Glen Oaks Avenue, Glen Oaks Boulevard, they didn't want the freeway going near their homes, and so they protested. It was known as the Battle of the Bulge, because that was a big battle in World War II, and so the freeway eventually did go through their neighborhood, of course. Um, and then another example of, uh, the subtitle of my book is How Freeways Shaped Los Angeles. I like to call this section How Los Angeles Shaped Freeways. <laughs> uh, and, and this is yet another example. This is the 105 freeway intersecting with the 405 freeway, the one that goes north-south. And that little bump there is known as the Hawthorne Belt. And that's where the 105, the Century Freeway, goes through Hawthorne, and eventually got it got looped upward, sparing a bunch of expensive homes. Again, a nicer neighborhood. They were able to have enough, um, pers uh, you know, for, well, enough of a voice and, and political persuasion to uh, route the freeway somewhere else. So, um, these are just some uh, slides that I'll go through that are examples of what used to exist the freeways. This is kind of the ghost of freeways, this, this little sequence. And uh, the, ho the Hollywood freeway used to have red lines, the red line going through it, Pacific Electric, trolleys, it connected Hollywood with the valley. And that lasted for about 10, 12 years. Um, it eventually got taken out in 54. And that median there is now um, extra lanes for the freeway. And everybody's, this is one of the things that comes up a lot, like, why did, why did they tear that up? And it, the, the tracks are pretty dilapidated, but it did raise a good idea of like why why didn't we see more of it? And it took 55 years for more for another light rail uh, to go through the center of the freeway, which is the Century Freeway in '93 when that opened. Um, and then if this is for all the like highway walks out there, but if you look under the Pilgrimage Bridge, which goes over the 101 freeway, there are little anchors still left there from where the red line, where the electrical wires were connected under the bridge and so that the, it basically uh, helped secure the electrical lines that were overhead from the trolley where it drew its electricity. Uh, also staying on the Hollywood freeway, that same red line uh, median down the center of the freeway also served passengers who would, could walk down a staircase that was um, descending from the, the Barm Boulevard bridge. So that's Barm before and after, obviously. Um, Sticking with Barham, that's the slide on the left is looking north. Um, and you, many of you, as you're going through Coenga Pass, might notice that there's an off ramp to Barham that's not being used now. It was decommissioned in the 80s. And these are known as like ghost ramps, uh, zombie ramps. You know, they're, they're still there, but they're dead. Um, Waterford off uh, 405 is one of them. Um, you know, there, there's a few of them here or there, but that one is still there and it was used as you can see in the 1940s um and here's another ghost ramp this is off the 110 freeway the royal seiko leaving south pass 
like right where it starts, this is the old exit for Fair Oaks Avenue. And there still is a Fair Oaks exit. It's just it was relocated about 300 feet north of this one. And this one, I think, was closed because it was difficult. You're kind of rounding this blind curve, and all of a sudden there's like an off-ramp, and it kind of surprised people, and they passed it, and it was kind of dangerous. So, um, it, okay, these are vestiges that are gone now. You can't see them, but as I mentioned earlier, when that guy got stranded on the raised curve, that median uh, on the Harbor Freeway, all the freeways had these raised medians with little ornamental plants, <laughs> like every 20 feet, which served no purpose and would often die. And then you've got weeds all over the freeway. Um, so that median right here, that's the Hollywood Freeway. And that's all that separated you from oncoming traffic. So there were a lot of gnarly head-on collisions. I love this picture on the right. That is the train that I showed you earlier from the Hollywood Freeway, the red line. It used to go underneath Highland and continue on Cahuenga. Um, I believe it's Cahuenga. I'm sorry. It, it went down Highland. And the southbound freeway traffic would go under that little tunnel. It would go in that tunnel there, and then it would continue uh, past that. That tunnel had a lot of accidents. It was not well lit. It was very narrow. It's very dangerous. You'd be in light. All of a sudden, it's dark. Um, but that eventually, the whole thing got uh, completely re-engineered. And then um, this is the last thing under the sequence. This is uh, on the right there, the on-ramp for uh, if you're driving through Eagle Rock and you want to hop on the 134 going for Pasadena. This is the on-ramp, the upper right there, which is a super long on-ramp because that used to be the beginning of the Colorado Freeway. Um, the Colorado Freeway was, as I mentioned earlier, they would often build freeways in trouble spots where there's a lot of congestion and accidents. And so the Colorado Freeway was only two miles and it was the section of Pasadena where the um, Colorado Street Bridge is. And you can see that on the map on the lower right, that little white loop or that little curve is the old Colorado Street Bridge, otherwise known as the Suicide Bridge. Um, so they built a little section of freeway there and uh, that eventually became the Ventura Freeway. It linked up with it and the Colorado Freeway went away. And on the left is the Colorado Freeway in uh, that's off the five as you enter Glendale. That was going to be the western hub of it. So anyway, that's those are just some of the um, ghosts of freeways past. Uh, then there are those freeways that never were. Um, this always fascinates people. Where were freeways not built? And um, this is just an example of some of those that just weren't built for various reasons. Um, the, or, yeah. the, the original vision was that no one would be more than four miles away. Correct. From a freeway throughout the LA area, which is astonishing. Where, where did yeah. they get that number? Do we know? I don't know where they got that number. I think it was just pulled out of thin air, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> As are so many things in engineering that yeah. we don't necessarily. It sounded right. Hear about. You know, it sounded right. Um, you know, I think probably if you break it down, they didn't want people driving more than 10 or 15 minutes to a freeway, which would be about four miles in LA traffic. Um, so what you see here are freeways that, as an example, let's say you live in the hills, the Santa Monica Mountains. Well, let's put let's put freeways through Laurel Canyon, Malibu Canyon, Topanga Canyon. Um, you know, those people have to be served also. I mean, at one point there were 10 to 12 freeways that were going to go through the Santa Monica Mountains. Luckily, I ended up with uh, the the San Diego Freeway and the Hollywood Freeway. Those are really the only two. So, yeah, that would have been something. Talk about, like, ruining nature. I, I don't think um, – I, somehow I don't think that would go over very well today. Um, this is more of the freeways that weren't built, and the one that's highlighted there is the Beverly Hills Freeway. Um, it would have started very close to here at the 405 and Santa Monica, Santa Monica Boulevard. And it mostly would have been subterranean, um, and then it would have linked up with the, um, the Glendale Freeway, the two which doesn't quite make it to the Hollywood Freeway, but the plan was to connect them all. So the, the Beverly Hills Freeway there would have connected with the two, and then the two, rather than ending in La Cunada Flint Ridge, as it does now, would continue, and it would be a freeway through Angeles Forest. So Angeles Crest Highway, the upper right there, would have been converted to a freeway. So, And Paul, should we be surprised that a freeway that would have gone right through Beverly Hills did not actually get built? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, uh, curious. Now, 
uh, one reason it didn't, uh, aside from the obvious fa fact that um, you had a lot of affluent people who had a really, you know, strong say with, with uh, City Hall and local politicians. Um, but the other, the other just, uh, factor working against it being built was it would not have had federal money. It would not have been an interstate. So the state would have had to pay $300 million to construct it, acquire right of way uh, rights, which they did, they started doing, started buying up properties. But yeah, uh, it was mostly people in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, West Hollywood said, not through our neighborhood. Um, the upper left is fascinating because uh, the engineers envisioned it being a subterranean freeway, like under Santa Monica Boulevard for much of it. And that's what that um, highlighted portion there points out. It was going to actually run along Sunset Boulevard. That was another option, like which doesn't make sense to me because it's so curvy. But um, if it went through as uh, a subterranean freeway along Santa Monica, that's a section of Beverly Hills by Rodeo Drive. And I went to preschool at that church. Uh, I mean, I'm Jewish, but it was a preschool open everybody. Uh, it's the Presbyterian Church. It's still there on Rodeo and Santa Monica. And um, I just, I love that picture just because that would have been me. At the time, there were train tracks going through there between uh, Little and Big Santa Monica up to the 70s. And the train would go through. And I remember like waving and he'd blow his horn. I'm on the jungle gym. And they're, gah, gah. So I did get to experience that. Um, and then, uh, as I said, this section in the middle there of the uh, highlighted portion that's where the Beverly Hills Freeway would have connected with the present Glendale Freeway. That would have been at where been Vermont Avenue goes over the Hollywood Freeway. And so when you're driving on the Hollywood Freeway going past Vermont, you notice a huge median in the middle. And there's some storage units there and there's like a Caltrans yard. That's because this would have been the footprint for a giant interchange connecting the Beverly Hills Freeway with the Glendale Freeway never got built. So um, that map in the upper right shows the extension that they were planning to do. Um, and in 1963, it was actually adopted. That was the route they're going to, they were going to take. But um, again, this was the beginning of a shift in public sentiment and a lot of protesters in Silver Lake, some of the wealthier people living in Silver Lake and the Hills were able to kind of put the kibosh on that. It, it, it but Ronald Reagan kept vetoing it, the, the, the vetoing the, uh, the decommissioning of it, and it kept alive legislatively until 1975, until it finally went away. Since you brought that up, and in New York, as you mentioned in the book once or twice, was famous for Robert Moses mm -hmm. pushing through spectacular, for lack of a better word, infrastructure projects. And, and he's sort of, for rightly or wrongly, solely credited with a lot of that. Was there a Robert Moses in LA? Or was it more a constellation of engineers and policymakers and, and, and all the rest? That's a great question. Uh, it, it really was more of a constellation. There were, um, Caltrans, back then they were called the Division of Highways and it was the Highway Commission that ran it. Um, they had a lot of power because just of the climate being what it was. Uh, they had everybody on their side. There wasn't any one single person. And I did interview someone who's 96 years old now. His name is Heinz Heckeroff, Caltrans veteran who basically was involved with every freeway from the Arroyo Seco to the Century Freeway. Wow. And he was a wealth of information. Mm -hmm. I, he wasn't, it wasn't his guiding vision, uh, but he was very much, in fact, he built the East Los Angeles Interchange. He was an advocate and remains to this day. He felt like, you know, they served their purpose and it's good that we built them. Um, but yeah, it, even it, in the early 60s, Robert Moses was encountering Resistance. Yes. Um, there's someone named Janet Jacobs who, Jane, 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 yeah, Jane, Jane, yeah, yeah, um, who helped re form this resistance in Soho and and uh, you know Lower Manhattan. Um, so yeah, th there wasn't one face attached to it here. Um, and then this was the uh, the Whitnell Freeway would have been a freeway that would have gone under the Hollywood sign uh, <laughs> into. And on the left there is is what the path it would have taken through the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, under the Hollywood sign, through the valley. Sections of it live in the valley is Whitnell Highway. That's the lower left there. That's a street in North Hollywood and Burbank with a huge median because the whole thing was graded when they thought the freeway was going to go through there. So they actually built a section of Whitnell just as a highway, but they thought they'd run a freeway through that. 
Um, and uh, you could see the pathway would have taken, it would have looped westward through the valley along Roscoe, and then it would have dipped into Malibu Canyon and lit out in Malibu. And the upper left there is a massive interchange by Pepperdine um, where Malibu Canyon, the Whitnell Freeway, would have ended up connecting with the Pacific Coast Freeway because it would have converted the highway into a freeway. So that's rendered in that picture as well. Oh, the, how the future that just could have been. Um, kind of move on. As I mentioned, the Pacific Coast Freeway was something that was legislatively on the books. That almost got built. That had a lot of um, support behind it. And in the 60s, uh, a gentleman, I, I can't remember his name, but he uh, advocated for putting a section of freeway over the Pacific Ocean off of Santa Monica through Santa Monica Bay. And it would have linked Santa Monica with Malibu because PCH at that point was so congested, they figured the freeway would be the same way. So why not just run it, you know, over the ocean? And those man-made islands there in this uh, rendering uh, would have been excavated out of the Santa Monica Mountains. And uh, it would have completely transformed. Well, they would everything. have had to build those mountains to build the freeways. They would have had plenty of fill to put in the bay. Yeah, that's true. And to create like that giant, um, I don't know, was that a peninsula, breakwater, you know. It would have been almost like Marina del Rey or off the coast of Florida. We have a lot of development, of little inlets and everything. Completely metamorphizing the coastline in a bad way. Um, so luckily that didn't happen. And, you know, look, if you couldn't build freeways, you at least build monorails. That was the other plan. We just uh, build monorails uh, along freeway medians. And um, the, uh, the the Allweg company built the monorail in Disneyland. They actually um, put in a bid to build a monorail along the 101 freeway, as you see there uh, on, the, on the left. And then also along the Harbor Freeway, connecting with what is now the Century Freeway. That eventually turned into the double deck transit way that we have now, that is the HO V lanes. That would have been a monorail uh, through the median of the Harbor Freeway. But monorails are just something we can't ever seem to, uh, we can't ever, we can't seem to let go of that vision of them being the panacea for solving traffic. That, Earlier, you asked about, you know, you pointed out that women are props in the opening of freeways, these beauty queens. Um, it wasn't until 1962, 63, this is this beautiful interchange. Some of you might recognize this even from the aerial. That's where the Santa Monica Freeway connects with the San Diego Freeway. And this was considered a model interchange. It was a uh, groundbreaking interchange because it was the first one in Los Angeles where you could drive through at freeway speeds. Think of the old interchanges like the four level in downtown or even the Ventura Freeway where you exit, you know, the, to get at the San Diego Freeway, you've got a 20 mile an hour clover leaf. Um, no, this one, you can go 55 miles an hour. It was a very wide footprint and uh, it was the first interchange with the aid of a computer and it was uh, designed by a woman and her name was Marilyn Reese and that's her upper right at her Caltrans desk. Um, that's her in the field with a contractor on the left in her Bullets Wilshire uh, suit. And um, she was the first female civil engineer in the state of California. And this is, we're talking the early 50s. I mean, that gives you some idea of like what things are like then. Um, Caltrans hired her and she worked her way up to help engineer that interchange. Um, there were others who, uh, other women, who um, early in, in the early 60s had very prominent positions with Caltrans. Uh, you could see Marilyn Reese in the upper right there, standing with a woman named Carol Schumacher, and she designed an interchange in Orange County and actually rose to the highest level of en a woman engineer in the state of California. And uh, the left photo there is someone named Peggy, Peggy Unruh, U-N-R-U-H, and that's her husband with her there, Tom, and they designed uh, what currently we know as the Glendale Ventura Freeway Interchange, where the two meets the 134. Very graceful interchange. I use it a lot. It's near our house. Um, you can see their model there. It looks just like the aerial, the lower right there. It has only one clover leaf. You can see a little leaf there. But otherwise, you could just soar through it. It's very majestic. Um, so women definitely left their stamp and uh, were treated very fairly by Caltrans. 
Not so much with the contractors. I know this because I spoke to Marilyn Reese's daughter several times. She's like in her 70s now. And she had these great stories about her mom. And uh, she could swear like a sailor and really hold her own. Uh, they, they underestimated her many times. She was only like five feet. And she kind of waddled up in her high heels. Um, anyway, yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a chapter that, that it, it was nice. It was among the more progressive agencies in the state was uh, the highways department. Um, opening those freeways. I mean, did you want to jump in with any questions or anything? No, keep going. I've got sure. To, until then, yeah, us off. of course. Uh, you know, it wasn't just the, uh, the freeway openings with the beauty queens, the big oversized scissors that were exciting. People could not wait for freeways to open. They would, um, you know, this is examples of like people taking their go-karts or roller skating on unfinished freeways. People would line up and look at Upper right there, it's the San Diego Freeway going through um, Sepulveda Pass. It was family viewing for this family to watch the tractors. And um, this section I kind of call the Freeway Follies because as freeways were being built, or once they were built, weird things have happened because we do live in Los Angeles. We are a weird place. You expect things like this. And freeways, of course, are no different. These are some uh, chickens that live by the side of the road. I remember seeing these chickens off the freeway. This is the uh, the 101 going past Vineland, and they were known as Minnie's chickens because an older woman named Minnie would start feeding them in the 70s, and they, they hung around and their descendants until the early 80s. Um, how did he end up there? People think it's from a poultry truck that had live poultry that overturned in 1969. They didn't get all the chickens. So there you go. And don't ask me why the chicken crossed the freeway. I have no idea. Um, does this look familiar to anyone? It's the Batmobile. Um, I just snapped, you know, threw one on here because Adam West, the original Batman in the TV show, uh, Batman from the 60s, uh, he overturned a, an experimental car, quote unquote, that's what it's called in the papers, on the Ventura Freeway. Flipped it over, he was okay, thank God. I like to think he was, he was kind of um, test driving a new Batmobile. We'll never know. Um, this was uh, this mysterious gentleman worked for Caltrans in 2001, and he used to put up a sign because going through downtown, the 110 freeway, as you're going north, uh, if you want to get on the five, if you keep going past Dodger Stadium on the 110, you have to get in the left lane to get on the five north. There was no five north sign for the longest time. So finally, a Caltrans worker, he installed a sign on the left side telling you to get in the left lane so that you know the five north cutoff is coming up when you're on the 110 going through downtown. Only problem is he didn't work for Caltrans. He was a, a guerrilla artist. His name was Richard Ankrum. And he decided he was just going to put this sign up to help people because he himself got so confused. And Caltrans, he did such a good job replicating their sign. They didn't notice for eight or nine years. <laughs> um, Oh, wait, scratch that. They they only knew because a year or two later, somebody who worked with him couldn't keep the secret any longer and came out with it. Caltrans did not take the sign down because they thought it was perfectly done to specs and it was safely installed. And they left it up there up until 2009. On the right, they put up new reflective signs, but they kept his five north feature of the sign, as you can see there. That on the right is the updated sign, and they kept five north on there. So that was kind of neat. Um, anyone remember Carmageddon, San Diego Freeway? Uh, this photo went viral during Carmageddon. This would have been 2011. So it's technically Carmageddon 2, the sequel, when they're widening the San Diego Freeway. And uh, the, these folks, these friends, decided they would um, take advantage of the empty freeway and have a candlelight dinner. And not only did this go viral, but the LA Times picked it up, did an article on it. And I remember reading scathing letters about it. Said, Why are you giving these trespassers a space in your paper? I actually reached out to the people in this photo or the guy who took the photo. And he's like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, yeah, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to these three folks. And, and uh, you know, yeah, they, they'll want to talk to you about it. I never heard back. I think they, they got cold feet. Well, we're on Carmageddon. That was when they widened the 405 freeway by Atlanta. Yeah. Um, what happens when you add a lane to a freeway? Does it make traffic free flowing and perfect and it solves everything? I think we all know the answer to that. Um, it does in the beginning and then 
there's this theory of late like four demand. months. Yeah, exactly. And I was doing that commute during right after Carmageddon. And I could see each year that was passing, it was getting worse and worse, even though the Sepulveda Pass had two new lanes added, one in each direction. And what it does, it induces more people to drive. It does not help. It's been proven time and again that widening freeways ultimately only brings more cars. So we could talk at the end about the future of freeways. I don't think widening freeways is the answer. I think I think even Caltrans recognizes that. That's that's a band-aid approach. It's not a good long-term approach. Um, and of course, this being LA, you, you can combine a car fire with a food truck <laughs> and people uh, using the food truck. This is on the Century Freeway, 2018. And traffic was a standstill for so long. A food truck um, that was on the freeway just opened up their siding and started serving people. I think today you'd probably call DoorDash and you would just dash on down there. Um, yeah. Tell us what's noteworthy about the Century Freeway and its timeline compared to the, all the other freeways you mentioned. Well, Century Freeway, there's a joke that it's called the Century Freeway because it took 100 years to build. In actuality, it took 35. It started in the 50s with all these other freeways that were built and they were planning, they were planning to build and that did get built. And it looked like that one was going to get built as well because it's pretty flat. It was only like 20 miles it's going through goes through under poor <laughs> neighborhoods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, underserved neighborhoods. It's like, ah, of all the freeways you'd bet on back then, you think that one would be complete. It wasn't because, um, I mean, there were, there were numerous reasons for one thing. It wasn't connecting a really congested area where people were going to the valley. You know, they wanted to build the 101 first or even the 210 and the 405. And by the time that they really put their attention and some money behind it, uh, it was the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, there was more austerity in Washington and, and with the state. It was harder to get freeways built. And uh, people started suing Caltrans. And there were class action suits. And a judge, Judge Pregerson, um, Harry Pregerson, ordered the freeway locked up, essentially. There was an injunction um, where the freeway, nothing happened for about eight years. And it wasn't until the 1983 that Caltrans satisfied the demands of the consent decree that the judge issued, which said they had to build low-income housing, uh, even like daycare centers, job training, apprentice training. Um, they had to employ uh, subcontractors that were like at least 35 percent minority or women it was very progressive and it really ushered us into the new era but because it took so long to build it a freeway that would have been built for about 50 million ended up costing close to 2 billion when it opened in 1993. so and just finishing the freeway follies here had to include oj right the slow speed chase on the 405 Raise your hand if you remember where you were when this happened. I mean, or some of us may not have been around, but um, I remember very well watching the Knicks game and seeing the split screen and uh, and then tuning to Channel 5. In my book, I give a riveting account of what this was like if you were living in L.A., watching KTLA News with Hal Fishman and his eye in the sky giving a play-by-play -play of what was going on. And then they had a third reporter in the back behind O.J. kind of zipping along saying, I'm falling now off sunset. It was like a play by, it was like a um, Mario Brothers game, although it's kind of life. It was quite fascinating. And of course the 405, it is it is the monster of all freeways. Everything about it's epic. Carmageddon, OJ, fires. It's so LA. This is the Skirball Fire 2017. This went viral when you saw this tunnel of flames on each side of the freeway. It was horrifying to watch. Um, I, I reached out to someone on Twitter and he gave me all his photos. So I included this one in the book. Um, and then uh, I, I'm only including this because, uh, I don't know, Caltrans, I guess any any bad publicity, any publicity is good publicity. This is the interchange of the Ventura and San Diego freeways. Caltrans um, had studies done in 1985 as they were surveying traffic. This was the most trafficked heavily trafficked freeway in the nation, um, the Ventura Freeway, and it eclipsed the San Diego Freeway for a moment in time. They often share that dubious title. And Caltrans reached out to Guinness Book of World Records in London. Hey, Los Angeles, this section of freeway is the most heavily trafficked freeway we think in the world. We wanted to get that recognition. And what do you think Guinness said? They, they kind of just sniffed at them and said, well, you need a third party, uh, um, verification of this. We can't just go with your word. Like, ask her. 
So it ended up not making it in Guinness, but they were very haughty about it. Um, shows they had standards. And I'm including this because this was, uh, this just happened on a freeway a couple weeks ago. This is again, the San Diego freeway. Not where it goes through LA though, though. This was in um, Carlsbad. A Brinks truck, the back wasn't fastened. A bag of money fell out, spreading thousands of dollars on the freeway, bringing all traffic to a standstill. And of course, people taping themselves on social media, putting it up there, pocketing, you know, 20s and hundreds. And uh, the cops, CHP put out a statement saying, you have 48 hours to return the money to the local CHP office. Many of them did. Um, but this actually was not the first time that's happened. There have been Brinks trucks that lost their loot on other freeways before. In the Hollywood freeway, a bunch of quarters, $7,000 worth fell off in the 60s. And people were scrambling around then trying to chase these rolling coins. Um, I thought this would be a good time to take a little detour and do like an interactive quiz here to test your, your freeway trivia. Free book for anyone who gets the most mm -hmm. answers right. How's that? <laughs> um, I, you probably I'm, can't play. I'll just play. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, friends and neighbors, uh, you know, or uh, strangers only. How's that? They we're all friends, though. Um, we, we wouldn't be if we were driving our cars. No, no, we wouldn't. I would hate you because you would have cut me off, like, trying to get in my lane. Way. Way. Yeah, each other's way. Um, okay. Anyone know where this interchange is? The uh, Clarence Wayne Dean interchange? We you see this yeah. sign? Yeah, the five and the 14, correct. And it's named after the CHP officer who, um, here, here's the interchange. Yeah, he was a, a motorcycle officer in 1994. And I think it was like several hours after the earthquake in 94 happened, the Northridge quake, 6.7 Richter scale, two of these overpasses fell. And he was on the 14 South heading to the five South. It was dark. He didn't know th that it had um, severed. And he flew off and fell like 40 feet to his death. And so this interchange is memorialized for him, Clarence Wayne Dean. Um, anyone know where this freeway is, Rosa Parks Freeway? 10. 10 Freeway, um, this, is, this is the section basically from South LA, like downtown, all the way to around the 405. And um, it was uh, designated that, I believe it said, what, 2002? So... Yeah, 2002 dedication. Um, interestingly enough, it's juxtaposed, just go another few miles west and you have the Christopher Columbus Freeway. <laughs> I don't know. You had, on the one hand, this champion of like underserved, you know, black uh, America. And then you've got this guy who subjugated people of color and uh, white guy. It, it's a weird dichotomy, but it's so LA, right? Only in LA. So that sign on the, on the right there, the Christopher Columbus, Transcontinental Highway, which refers to the 10 going basically from Santa Monica to Jacksonville, Florida. The Board of Supervisors is trying to remove that sign. And I've been hearing this for a while. It hasn't happened yet, but it's just not a good look because also we've been removing or changing even the Columbus holiday. And so it's just not in tune with the times, let's put it that way. So, but it is still there because I saw it the other day. Um, Glenn Anderson Freeway, many freeways are not necessarily named after what we call them. Does anyone know where the Glen Anderson Freeway is? Who said something? The what's, I'm sorry? The 105. the 105, yeah, Century Freeway, exactly. Um, nobody uh, ever since, uh, it, before that, or then, now, no one calls it the Glen Anderson Freeway. We do call it the Century Freeway. That's the Century Freeway. That's the Judge Pregerson interchange there, where the 110 and 105 junction Judge Ferguson is the one who shut down the Century Freeway in order, you know, to create a more equitable freeway. The first freeway with heart, he called it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the Century Freeway going west, uh, west east through there. This one's a little trickier for some people. Anyone know where the Ritchie Bounds Memorial Highway is? Section of freeway. Think of like where he lived, where he grew up. Not the two ten. So 118 is a great guess. It's not the 118, um, but it junctions with it. No, should I just tell you guys? It's the, it's the five. Yeah, it's, it's the Golden State Freeway. It's the, the five freeway where it just passes the 170. 
and then it connects with the 118. There's like a three mile section there between those two freeways. That's the Ritchie Valens Memorial Highway. Um, and there you go. There's a look, you know, you, you might recognize that's where the 170 is joining the five on the left there. Um, this was just put up a year ago or so. This is the Caltrans District 7. That's our district for Caltrans. Um, it's the Fallen Workers Memorial Interchange. And you might be able to tell from the landscape there, the mountains, where this might be. But does anyone want to hazard a guess? Four or five. five. Four or five. Yeah, it, it is the 405, actually where it meets the 210. So right before the 210, uh, it's um, that section there. And that's really a reference to the Caltrans workers who lost their lives building freeways, um, some losing lives from earthquakes, some just through work. Um, I think the number has been 60, 70 people building freeways lost their lives going back several decades. Um, anyone know what this is called? Those little dots you see when you're Bots changing dots. lanes? Bots, dots. Did you just know that? You didn't read my book? That's yeah, um, that's not uh, Mr. Bot there on the right. Um, that's a guy who worked with Albert Bots, and the Albert Bots created these ceramic little turtles, they call them, so that when you're falling asleep and you're the, oh, it's like, ah, oh, uh, those are Bots dots. And uh, those are some workers putting it on the Hollywood Freeway in 1966. By the way, those are being phased out because they keep coming off the road and they're not replacing them. They're just doing more reflective uh, paint. I like Bots dots, though. I, I miss. I'm gonna miss that little rumble. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it has a practical value, which is it wakes you up if you're getting drowsy. And there are many freeways now that don't have these. And I feel like that's kind of a disservice to the drowsy of the world. I don't know. Um, this is, um, well, this is a mission bell. They're lining one particular freeway. Uh, hey, at least this is still running. Does anyone know what freeway they line in Los Angeles? The 101, the Harbor, uh, sorry, this, the Hollywood Freeway, also the Ventura Freeway, extending all the way up California. Uh, they basically are there to recognize El Camino Real, the King's Road, the Royal Road. That was the road that uh, Spain used and, and Indians before that. You know, freeways often were built in, no surprise, wagon roads, uh, foot roads, um, this particular, Freeway, uh, the, the 101 has the bells alongside. Three of them were stolen in Ventura County in the last couple of years. So they're 85 pounds each. I don't know you make off with that. Um, how well do you know your presidential name freeways? So I accidentally said what freeway this was earlier in the slide. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't say that. What freeway is this? 118, exactly. This is also known as the Simi Valley Freeway, the 118. Um, this sign only went up in 2017, not Santa Monica. Anyone else? Think of where uh, President Obama lived when he was in LA or what school he went to. It's near the two. Yeah, Eagle Rock. Yeah, it's, it's the 134. The 134, yeah, from the two to the 210. It's that three, four mile section. When he uh, went to Occidental College, he lived in Pasadena, and the stretch is named after him. Typically, you don't name freeways after living people because there could be a bad, bad idea, which we'll see here in a second. Um, so far, Obama's holding up his end of the bargain. Uh, here is a look at the um, Google Street View of the freeway. Here's why you don't name freeways after living people. Right, yeah, exactly. This is the 90, correct. Um, the 90s, known as the Marina Freeway, many people call it the Rich Kids Freeway or the Silicon Valley uh, Parkway, you know, like Silicon Beach, excuse me. It's it's almost like a country club freeway. And it's and we love it because it's so short. You know, it's it's the 90 freeway. It goes about two or three miles from the 405 of the beach. You're looking at the sunset, the marina. It's really cool. And uh, some Republican legislatures legislators in uh, california in the early 70s wanted to name the freeway after him. It, it had just been built and it kept getting shot down and then there were enough republicans in the state um senate and the assembly to um enact the resolution and it was converted it was changed to the richard m nixon freeway uh 
cut to a year later or so, Watergate happened. He resigned in disgrace in 1974. Uh, the freeway <laughs> was bearing his name. Um, and so reverted back to the Marina Freeway in 1976. And what you see here is if you take, the Marina Freeway was gonna go all the way to Yorba Linda. It was gonna be called the Marina Slauson Freeway. It would have crossed the 605, the 710, the 110, and ended up in his hometown, just coincidentally. So in Nixon's hometown, to this day, you have the Richard Nixon Freeway. It's a little portion of freeway next to his library. But it doesn't know whether it's a freeway or a parkway because going in one direction, you have the Richard Nixon Freeway and you go the other direction, it's the Richard Nixon Parkway. And then if you go on Google Maps, it says it's Imperial Highway. So like the man himself, it's complicated. I don't know if it's, um, that I think ends our little uh, um, quiz detour. Um, sir, over there, Mr. Levy, you win yourself a book for getting uh, at least three of these. Thank you all for playing that. And then um, I really just have a few more slides and we can pause here if you want before I get in anything else. No, let's bring it home. Okay, bring it home, yeah. Um, I mentioned earthquakes earlier um, when I uh, mentioned uh, Clarence Dean, the CHP uh, officer. This was the severed uh, ramp connector there, the 14 freeway that fell not just during the 94 quake, but during the 1971 Silmar quake, the exact same transition road collapsed. Um, and at the time, the Doobie Brothers thought it would make a great cover, a great photo for their uh, new album, um, The Captain and Me. And when you're the Doobie Brothers, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can dress in Civil War garb or whatever, the stagecoach and go under a separate freeway and it all makes sense. Um, so it actually graces their album of 1971. Um, that particular interchange was, it's in a very seismic, um, like vulnerable, seismically vulnerable canyon, that whole Newhall Pass area. Because just south of that, this is where the 5 and the 210 meet, and this collapsed in 1971 as well. You can see a pickup truck completely obliterated there on the left. You can see the word Chevrolet. Two men died in that truck. The quake hit at 6.01 a.m. in February of 1971. I was like four or five years old. I remember that quake. And the stopwatch got crushed of one of the men and just stopped at 6.01. It was kind of like creepy. But these look like tinker toys. It looks like a monster just stepped on it. And there were, you know, certainly they had to start retrofitting freeways and continue to do that through the 90s, um, which I'll get to in a second. This is the dam of lower... Um, it's the Lower Norman Reservoir that you can see when you're driving up the 405, where the 405 and 5 connect. There is a, a basin on the left, also known as the um, San Fernando Lakes. And this was filled at the time. It's now a basin. And this is 3.5 billion gallons of water. This is the earthen dam that started collapsing during the 1971 Silmar quake. That dam, had it shaken, had it collapsed any more, like a, a few more seconds would have elapsed of the earthquake, the entire thing would have given away, according to geologists. And you would have had three and a half billion gallons of water flooding the valley because just beyond that dam is Granada Hills, Silmar, all the Northern Valley communities. And they predicted anywhere from 60 to 120,000 people would have died. It would have been far and away the worst disaster in the history of the United States. And we averted it by mere seconds. Quite chilling when you look at that. Uh, yeah, so they drain this after that, and, and it's no longer filled. Um, this brings us to the 94 earthquake. As I mentioned, that same Newhall Pass interchange collapsed then. Um, what you see, in, some of these shots actually are just north of that. Many people forget in the Gavin Canyon area of Santa Clarita, right? As you leave Los Angeles, you could see like the LA city limits there facing the other direction. Um, this, this collapsed as well, that section of, that would have been the, Five. Um, many people don't know the Simi Valley Freeway. The Ronald Reagan Freeway also collapsed a section of it near Woodley. This is a picture of that. Yeah, so here's the 10, not too far from here, exactly. Robertson, La Cienega. Oh, wow. Okay, next, next reprint of my book, I'm putting that in. 
Um, yeah, you can see the, now this is the Santa Monica freeway. Um, I actually went down there. I, I took that, a picture like that in the one on the lower left. Um, there were, I remember people collecting rubble and I came across in my research and some kid started selling it for $5 a pop. No eBay then. I don't know where he sold it. And um, so, yeah, it was like claiming your own little Berlin wall, like claiming the rubble of the freeway. Um, this freeway was rebuilt in record time. Many of the long timers here might remember that. It took them only three months to repair all the bridge work and get it going again because the city was losing a million dollars in, you know, in, uh, in, in the economy by having the freeway shut down, going to the west side. And because it is the west side, it got precedence over other freeways that were damaged. And so even then, it was very, um, there were inequalities in terms of what got the priority. And the priority for this freeway, and it became a political photo op as well, was reopening the Santa Monica Freeway, connecting the west side with downtown. Um, Al Gore showed up on behalf of uh, President Clinton, who wanted a second term and needed those west side votes. Um, and uh, yeah, and Mayor Reardon was there. It was like a big to do to finish the freeway in record time. Um, the Santa Monica Freeway, of course, also anyone who's lived here a while may remember it was the site of the very first HOV lane in LA. But rather than creating HOV lanes, or as they were called then, the Diamond Lane, um, in 1976, Caltrans just took the fast lanes, the left lanes of each direction of, of Santa Monica Freeway, and converted it to three or more, not even two or more, but three or more. And um, this was kind of like during the environmental era, starting, you know, trying to conserve gas. Um, this goes back to World War II when we were trying to preserve rubber, fuel, you know, part of the war movement. If you are driving an empty car, you are basically riding alone with Hitler. Um, you see the ghost of Hitler there. You're just helping the Axis powers and, and the Nazis help us win the war because we're, we're wasting fuel, we're wasting rubber, we're wasting precious resources. Everyone needs to carpool. So I just, I love these, these vintage carpool. Um, and after World War II, we felt the freedom to build cars and well, build tires and burn gasoline. Yes, I'm so glad you said that because uh, going back to this uh, Diamond Lane, it became this fiasco. It opened in March of 1976, and it, it all was about freedom. The people people started protesting because you can see no one was driving in that far left lane. That's the Diamond Lane, and 97 percent of the drivers then were either one or two people. So only three percent were three or more, and buses could travel it as well. So they didn't really do their homework on this, Caltrans. They didn't even do an environmental impact report. And it was supposed to help the environment. <laughs> um, so people were up in arms and they were claiming their freedoms were infringed upon. Um, they protested um, Governor Brown's offices here in, in Los Angeles. Uh, that is Councilman Kenneth Hahn passing out, stamp out uh, the Diamond Lane bumper stickers. Um, that woman on the left, unfortunately, was vilified. She was the head of Caltrans. It was not her idea to do the diamond lane and just steal lanes in each direction to create them. She just inherited the project. She came on the day that they opened. Talk about a bad first day at the office. And then this went national because for months, people were, they were throwing thumbtacks on, on the diamond lane. They were dumping paint on it. They're throwing beer cans and worse at, at some of the Caltrans workers. It got really ugly. And people said, people in Corvettes and Porsche said, well, this discriminates against me. They started suing Caltrans. My car is two-seater. What the hell? You can't discriminate against a sports car drivers. You know, so it, it got to be really ugly. And I remember watching this at the time, like people screaming, this was socialism, it's communism. You're forcing us to ride in strangers' cars. And Johnny Carson, when he was uh, doing his bid as Cormac the Magnificent, a Carnac, excuse me, um, that's where he would divine the answer to something. All of us remember The Tonight Show. And one of his jokes was he, he held the envelope up to his head. This was in the summer of 1976. And the answer was Zsa Zsa Gabor, who had been married many times, and he always made jokes at her expense. So that was the answer. And then he ripped open the envelope, blew into it like he did, and he read the question. And the question was, um, what does Zsa Zsa Gabor call the center of a church? So the Zsa, diamond Zsa. lane. Yeah, also referring to Diamond Lane here off the Santa Monica Freeway. And you can see a national newscast there on the bottom. ABC, NBC, CBS all picked it up. 
um, poor Adriana Gianturco, the head of Caltrans, by the end of the summer, a judge ruled that it had to revert back to regular lanes. The diamond lanes went away. She was called the diamond lady. Um, again, it wasn't her idea. She got death threats. There's a lot of misogyny. People kind of, she, by the early 80s, she was done with uh, public service and, and started restoring old homes. She, she was the top position of any agency in the state of California. And like within three or four years, she was just done with it. And that little sign there to the left is her little winking joke um, when there was briefly, there was a uh, carpool lane on the 405 freeway in 77. But rather than converting the fast lane to a carpool lane, they let people drive on the shoulder, the left shoulder, and they put a diamond on it. Um, that only lasted a few weeks because it was deemed unsafe. But when, she, when it opened, she said, uh, basically, you know, you're welcome, a little happy face there, left lane now open and signed it. So she did have a sense of humor about it. And to this day, there is no rideshare lane on the Santa Monica freeway, as we all experience, unfortunately. Um, I'll just kind of rifle through these and we're kind of up at the end of the future of freeways. But I call this the once upon a time in Hollywood section because freeways have always been part of movies. Even in the 60s, um, there was a Doris Day movie shot in 1967. Uh, something about Josie, the tale of Josie, I think it's called. Kind of a forgettable movie. But it did include 1,500 sheep grazing on the hillside of Universal City, um, which started as a sheep pasture and then became a studio. But they reconverted to a pasture for the freeway, uh, for the movie, going through Coenga Pass. And Coenga Pass in the upper left there was also the site of Spartacus when they were shooting that. And people driving by on the freeway could look up there and see ancient Romans and uh, Stanley uh, Kubrick, I suppose. Um, now, how does... Judge Walker factor into freeways. Well, he, they didn't really shoot the people's court on a freeway. That was a long running show. I went to see Rain Man, you know, he loved it. Um, but Judge Walker was a real judge in California and um, he oversaw a bribery case in the mid sixties involving the Marina Freeway. And um, it was actually involving an assemblyman who uh, was taking a $10,000 bribe, allegedly, from businessmen who didn't want this freeway to nowhere, as they called it, through Sepulveda and Slauson. And it was a business group that uh, paid him off, essentially, to try to like not get the freeway built. And so <laughs> Judge Walker oversaw the case. His bailiff was Rusky. There really was a Rusky in real life. He brought him to the TV show. And this was also a juryless case. Judge Walker decided the assemblyman was not guilty. So there you go. Um, the two freeway, the two, the 118, the 210, as I mentioned earlier, in the 70s, money kind of dried up the freeways. So it left these unfinished freeways. And so what do you do with unfinished freeways? You shoot on them, right? So you have like car chases, you have uh, the movie Cannonball um, or um, Death Race 2000 with uh, Sly Stallone there. Um, and then if you're very enterprising, you do what Columbia Pictures Television did from 1976 to 1980. You rent the freeway to shoot chips on the 210 freeway. And uh, so when you watch that show, it's always like these freeways in the valley where Ponch and John are chasing down a runaway tra tractor trailer or uh, you know grabbing baby food with botulas and then fell off the back of a truck and saving babies. Um, yeah, so I love that show as a kid. I always noticed though that the car wrecks were always old cars. You never saw a really nice Beamer get smashed up. I, I wonder why that is. And then some of you might remember the CHP headquarters in Chips was under a freeway overpass. Anyone remember that? I mean, this is going, this is going really deep now, but I do. And that is, it was and still is a CHP headquarters under the two, the, the 10 freeway where the 10 and the 110 meet. So this is a ramp that connects, I believe this is actually the 10 connecting with the 110 South. And I shot this picture of a CHP cruiser just going through, and uh, that that actually exists, and that's used in the TV series. And then uh, I was watching Paris, Texas, a Ben Bender's movie, 1984, and they shot under the interchange of the the five and the four and and the fourteen. That's that's actually one of the transition roads that collapsed. So hopefully they were careful and had their picnic in the back of the truck there. Um, and then of course we all remember Speed. Speed was the runaway truck, Sandra Bullock. That was supposed to be Santa Monica Freeway, the Century Freeway doubled as the Santa Monica Freeway in the movie. 
and that little section there is where the bus jumped over the connector. Um, and lastly, probably the most famous uh, scene on a freeway, at least in the modern era, La La Land. The opening of La La Land is the, the transition road, the carpool corridor that goes from the 105 west, east, excuse me, connecting with the 110 north. And um, the director was able to get Caltrans to shut down the carpool lane there, the overpass for about two days to shoot that uh, musical sequence at opens the movie. And uh, that's the Hollywood, Hollywoodation of, of freeways there. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of talk about the whatever you want to discuss in the future freeways or where we're at now. Well, just watching these photos, it's amazing to see all the stories and minutia all the way through the big picture you know, of the financing the planet. Um, what occurs to me in the future freeways is we haven't built one in a long time. We've widened them, we've tweaked them, and so forth. But over the past 15 or so years, we've been focusing on public transit, a lot of rail transit. We have authorized tens of billions of dollars of sales tax funded funding for local public transit with some roads and so forth, a lot with some federal um, upfront loans. How does this all fit together now? We've got the Expo line, the Crenshaw line opening up soon. We've got all sorts of stuff. Just yesterday, they released potential routes for a rail line over, under, around the Sepulveda Pass. What, what's that going to be, 80 years beyond when they first put the freeway in? How does all this fit together going forward? What can we learn from how these freeways develop at first? What do we know about our current moment? Well, I think we know that you can't widen freeways and have that be the answer. Um, you brought up Sepulveda Pass. Uh, when we when Measure M passed, that allowed money for some of the transit to go through there. I think it's five billion dollars. It's it's going to take over a period of uh, a couple decades. At least, yeah. Um, that is hopefully part of the answer. Um, I think also, I I feel like uh, making transit more attractive to people, making it free or heavily discounted is a way to go. Um, my wife is sitting back here, Susie. Um, we have kids who, uh, at least our daughter. Um, they, she uses light rail and buses for free because of the pilot program now where uh, school kids can use it for free. And imagine expanding that to any age, right? I mean, that's quite an incentive to get out of your car. Um, and then I think the other answer is going to be, unfortunately for all of us, but it's this reality, is congestion pricing and making it um, less attractive to take freeways. And the bringing up the San Diego freeway again through Sepulveda Pass, they're going to build express lanes, which is kind of a misnomer. Because um, you won't be going very fast, probably. But essentially, they, those are HOT lanes, uh, like the, uh, the the fast track lanes on the 110 and other freeways. You'll have to pay uh, for every freeway around here, and that might expand to some of the regular lanes too at some point in time. Um, is that fair? You know, now you get into the fairness question. Is that because those are often termed Lexus lanes, right? And you can be a single driver and you can pay a little money and get on them and blow past all the riffraff. Um, I don't know the answer. It's going to be a combination of many things, I think. Yeah. Well, was it fair in the first place to build freeways and make them free to motors? Yeah. And is, was it fair to these communities that uh, got to, that to this day are still divided? And I think one of the answers there is maybe these cap parks. There's been proposals of running green belts over freeways, trench freeways, right? Submerged freeways. The Hollywood freeway where it goes through Hollywood would look something like this. And this is on their website, Hollywood Central Park. There hasn't really been a lot of momentum with this lately. There was about a decade ago. It would cost about a billion dollars. But guess what? It took at least a billion dollars to widen the 405 during Carmageddon and we're left with more traffic. This would repair these communities. Hollywood, East Hollywood, these are some of the most congested areas of the city. And it would also help mental and physical health, freeways near neighborhoods. Uh, you have higher incidence of asthma, respiratory diseases, cancer. Um, I, I almost feel like, you know, it, it would cost more to not do it, you know, in terms of the human cost. Um, so I would love to see something like this, someone with the, the imagination to kind of get the ball rolling on this, or maybe that comes out of the infrastructure bill to create some cap parts. So in the meantime, we always have the Glendale freeway. This is uh, this is probably the most attractive vista of all the freeways as you go south on the two toward downtown. That's kind of my closing slide there. 
actually this this is because yeah. it is the end of the slides. So we'll take a few questions in the last five or six minutes. In, in the way back. Yeah, some of those projects were already in motion before. Like, I don't think there's any that are new. Um, it's not a perfect package, as far as I understand. I think the LA Times ran an article about a week ago that they're going to widen a section of interstate in Houston, which goes through a lot of underserved communities. Um, so it's still a problem. It's not like the problem's gone away. Um, but in terms of traffic mitigation, it's proven that it won't ultimately help. So, but some of them were grandfathered in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And these things are generational. It takes, yeah. you know, we thought freeways were an amazing idea in the 50s, and it took, you know, decades to realize, oh, maybe they're not such a good idea. Yeah, and it started it's sort of amazing from amazing how these how long these timelines are. Right, and it, it was it was we were kicked in the butt to do it from the federal government. I mean, if you're dangling ninety percent of the budget will be paid for by the government, you're going to build freeways. Um, that's yeah. you know. Knowing what we know now, would that have affected the whole nine new freeways together? I always found that that's a whole other topic I could have gone really deep on. It's like I love the, the advances in engineering from one freeway to the next. And so certainly, you know, the Arroyo Seco is not a freeway to go very fast on, even the Hollywood Freeway. Uh, there is things they don't do anymore. They don't, some of the on-ramps and off-ramps are too close together. Um, here's what I would, I would do differently. Not every freeway needs to be a eight or 10 lane freeway. You can have like, and, and this is kind of like, uh, I've noticed some engineers, traffic engineers have pointed this out, that you could have done maybe like four lane freeways, you know, um, they don't have to be really wide and as disruptive. It wouldn't be as disruptive. They're more like expressways, kind of like what Robert Moses was doing mm. in New York. Some of those were expressways. They weren't massive freeways. Massive freeways don't have to be the answer to everything. These wide, 400 foot wide freeways. You can do one that's maybe 75 feet wide and connects a couple of communities. So I would think smaller, by my way. Or have different arterials, you know, a couple that are just a little, not as wide, instead of one massive thoroughfare. Yeah. Yeah. Electrification, hydrogen, uh, autonomous. Oh, and autonomous. Yeah, I don't, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering what you guys think. Because I've often wanted that myself. So I've also read that there's legislation that if you're in an autonomous car, you can't be drunk. Is that the whole point to sit in one? Like if you're leaving a bar, like what's, what's the point? Like I don't know. I mean, a lot of theories of autonomous vehicles are that it's going to induce sprawl because it reduces the quote-unquote pain of driving. So you can live out in Coachella and let your robot drive you to work downtown. Thereby putting more cars on the road, but yeah. maybe not emissions if it's electric. And, you know. True. Yeah, and I, I was glad to read that we're finally going to do something about diesel trucks. You know that they're going to be under the same emission standards as cars. They, they, they never have been. I was, I was shocked to read that. And by the way, I did want to point out when Carmageddon happened and they widened the San Diego Freeway. You know, like it's traffic started getting bad again in 2015, 2016. That was also the, the rise of ride shares and Uber and Lyft, and um, you know they. We saw how transit, uh, public transit, started plummeting during the rise of these rideshare programs and apps, and uh, those were a lot of the cars on the road then. So you do have to look at that too and wonder how that's going to factor into traffic patterns in the future. Yeah. Jen, how are we doing? Uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Okay. I want to let everybody know that in addition to freeways, I'll be up for sale here. If you have too many books you might be interested in, um, all this novel that came out this year. Also, Paradise Palms. Do you want to say something about this? Uh, you know, I, it's this is another ode to LA. In fact, you can even see the Hollywood Freeway on the cover there. It's kind of just a coincidence. But yeah, I'll just say that, um, you know, I, I, I have to scratch that itch every once in a while and do fiction. And so they say, write what you know. So I wrote a story based on 
Hollywood in the 1950s, um, you know, just because I'm obsessed with that era in old L.A. and, and uh, kind of centered around this hotel in Hollywood that is being taken over by the mob, by like Mickey Cohen's um, gangster pals. And uh, they're using it for like different vice, abortion, um, backdoor abortions, prostitution, drugs. And uh, this family is trying to hold on to their hotel. And they're kind of caught in the middle. So thank you for that. And then all of Josh's book, The Urban Mystique, which is a collection of essays, and you want to say a little bit about this? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, Urban Mystique is a complement to Paul's book because it's about land use. So it's about what's going on in housing and urban design and so forth. And it does mention transportation, but not as quite the deep dive, but it's, you can sort of imagine it as all the spaces in between freeways, collected works of mine sort of from. 2005 through 2018, which in urban planning terms is actually covers a pretty interesting time period. I totally want to read that. Please. And it's yeah. funny you mentioned earlier, so some of you know I did 10,000 Steps Day in LA, uh, 57 Walking Ventures is the latest book. And Jen, the funny thing is that Freeway Topia is almost like the sequel to that, whereas that book was seeing LA through your feet, um, you know, walking different paths to explore different sections of the city. And Freeway Topia is seeing it through your windshield. And, but I'm also telling, I'm ostensibly telling the story of LA from your vehicle rather than your feet or from the sidewalk. And I realized that after as I was writing it, like this seems the same but different. Yeah. So, yeah. And Interesting. Right. it's I a way in. Sold out on that one. But, um, cool. Yeah. But, so, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Thanks for thank having you. us. Jen, yeah. thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>